Hi, I'm Spencer Christian. On this episode of Tracks Ahead, an Arizona garden railroad baked in the sun and shaded by nearby mountains, and an inside look at the narrow gauge Iowa Slim Princess. But first, we join the National Railway Historical Society as they ride, explore, and enjoy the celebrated Iowa Interstate Railroad. Let's get started. It's 8 o'clock on a Tuesday morning in Cedar Rapids, Iowa. While locals hurry to work, a small group of travelers wait alongside a dusty track interchange. The spot is called Smith Dow's Yard, and for the next two days, it's the starting point for a celebrated excursion along the Iowa Interstate Railroad. From across the United States, members of the National Railway Historical Society have made the trip here to add miles and make new memories. With more than 13,000 members, the NRHS is the largest rail preservation organization in the United States. My name is Tony White and I'm from Stanford, Connecticut. Uh, a lot of the lines that we ride on with Amtrak, passenger service, but on the freight lines, you don't get to ride on that often, so that's rare mileage for you. I'm uh, Andy Brown, I'm from Moscow, Iowa. From what I hear, we're gonna get a couple photo run-bys, which are always great, because when you're riding the train, you don't get to see the train, so that's, you know, it gives us a chance to see the train from the outside that way. I'm Bill Crawford from Boston, Massachusetts. I'm what we call in the railroad fan hobby, a mileage collector, meaning I wanna ride every mile of track in the world before I check out. Now that's not gonna happen, but uh, I'm gonna, gonna give a slug at it. A spin-off of the abandoned Chicago, Rock Island, and Pacific Railroads, the Iowa Interstate is a well-maintained, thriving regional railway. It moves more than 125,000 carloads of freight each year. The line stretches over 500 miles between Council Bluffs, Iowa, and Chicago, Illinois. For a part of this day's trip, the train's head end is a diesel engine painted to commemorate the Rock Island Freight locomotive that carried grains, livestock, and coal between farmland and urban centers from the 1850s to the early 1900s. Communities relied on this line to help build towns and support new cities. Nowadays, the Iowa Interstate relies on progress and growing customer base and forward-thinking visionaries to carry their freight forward. Henry Posner III took controlling interest of the Iowa Interstate in 2004. Iowa Interstate is a completely different railroad than the Rock Island. Our market is serving local customers in Iowa and Illinois. We, we, we don't compete with the parallel class ones. You look at the map and say, who needs a fourth railroad from Chicago to Omaha? Our customers, our online customers, are virtually 100% of our business. We're a nice size railroad, we're large enough we can professionally handle anything which comes along, but we're also small enough that with my staff, we can get things solved fairly quickly. Main commodities we carry are ethanol, corn syrup, uh, gluten meal. Uh, we also carry a lot of straight grains and corn, soybeans, uh, scrap steel. We have some paper business. We carry a whole gamut of uh, commodities for different types of customers. Oh, Interstate uh, now is known for customer service. We do innovative things. We're not tied to one thing. You tell us what you want to, want to move and how it needs to move and we'll figure a way to do it. Back in 2007, Interstate management forecast a huge surge in freight traffic. To avoid a substantial investment in crew and facilities, they purchased a dozen state-of-the-art General Electric diesel engines to handle the welcome growth. The GE 4400 AC locomotives have done a couple things for us. Number one, they're 29% more fuel efficient. Number two, they have better traction efforts. So on a train which may have had to have five of our prior locomotives, we could just use two locomotives to carry the same amount of freight. Number three, the emissions controls meet U.S. standards to make a greener environment, 
and they also have a higher degree of computerization to be much safer locomotives or train crews. Well, we've received uh, three Harriman Awards, but we got two uh, gold Harriman Awards for our safety performance relative to other railroads our size. Safety really is number one because if you're running a safe railroad, you're more likely to have uh, good service. If you're more likely to have good service, you're more likely to have more business. If you got more business, you're going to make a profit. I've been in the railroad industry for 46 years. Instead of working five derailments a night as a train master, uh, we don't have derailments. So uh, it's, it's very enjoyable. Uh, the track is in excellent condition. A short line railroad like us being able to buy uh, brand new locomotives is unheard of. It's nice to be on a railroad that is growing rather than one that was fading. The Iowa Interstate Railroad is a spectacularly successful property that Henry Posner has made a tremendous success out of something that uh, others were not able to make successful. It was a portion of the Chicago, Rock Island, and the Pacific, which uh, unfortunately went bankrupt and went out of business in the early 1980s. If you had looked at this company back when Henry did, you might have said, you know, it's on its death throes, uh, it's not going to go anywhere. But Henry saw differently. He saw that this company had the ability to grow and to prosper. The company, in essence, was steadied out back in the early 2000s by gaining a very good relationship with our largest customer. Ethanol has probably been the single most important driver of the growth of the Iowa Interstate from a marginal regional railroad to the railroad that it is today. We didn't plan on ethanol, we'd never heard about it, and uh, we survived long enough to take advantage of the opportunity that ethanol represented when it appeared literally out of nowhere. As the train nears the Mississippi River, passengers scramble outside the rail cars to get a peek at Government Bridge. This two-tier trestle is unique in that its rail deck was built on top, with its highway deck running below. It also provides a rich chapter for the Iowa interstate story. It's the third bridge in that location. Uh, the first bridge was, in fact, the first bridge across the Mississippi. And at the time, it was, shall we say, disliked by the steamboat interests. And so uh, it was rammed by a steamboat. So we went out and hired a young lawyer by the name of uh, Abraham Lincoln. And he successfully defended a rock island. Uh, against the steamboat company, and uh, that in turn had the effect of uh, launching his legal career and ultimately his becoming president of the United States. So uh, there, there's a lot of very rich history there. Another important piece of railway history awaits at today's final stop in Rock Island, Illinois. The last leg of the National Railway Historical Society excursion will be led by the most unique member of the Iowa Interstate Fleet, the Chinese QJ-class steam locomotive. Henry is a historian at heart. When China decided to go to uh, diesel locomotives, he purchased two QJ locomotives and brought them to the United States to keep them from the cutting torch. He wanted to preserve uh, history. One's pulling our trains today, the 6988. We've kind of Americanized it a little bit, a little bit different look, but the 7081, our other locomotive, pulled the last long distance passenger train in China. That will be kept in its, uh, in its original condition. The last mainline steam locomotive in the U.S. was uh, off the rails by 1960. So we that are interested in history uh, are able to turn back the clock uh, via what uh, Iowa Interstate has done and uh, my daughters and other children 
uh, we'll have the opportunity to see these uh, absolutely fantastic machines at work. Uh, the sights, the sounds, it's just spectacular. Think of the irony. By virtue of circumstance, we got to the point where the Iowa State was formed, and then it survived, and then it began to prosper. At the same time, uh, Chinese railways continue to expand and are one of the world models of railway development. And the opportunity came to combine these Chinese locomotives which never were intended to come to the USA on this railroad, the Iowa Interstate, which was never supposed to survive. From an abandoned, bankrupt line to a thriving, award-winning regional carrier, one can't help but wonder what the future holds for the Iowa Interstate. I think our future is very bright. We're looking at growth potentials between 10 and 20 percent a year. We're looking at further bringing of traffic, which will be better for the environment in terms of less greenhouse gas emissions. And we're looking to add additional jobs, which will help out the economy in the United States. Iowa Interstate is going to grow. Uh, we just keep adding business. The fun part is trying to find ways to handle it. If you can survive and run a safe railroad and be there long enough for good things to happen, it'll probably be better than it is today because history has shown in the last decade or so that you got to make your own luck and that it's more about being lucky than good. But if you're good, then you can be lucky. Next, the hot, dry Arizona climate with its almost constant sunshine is a perfect place for outdoor garden railroading. Let's visit with a husband and wife team who have built a wonderful testament to their desert home. The foothills of the Santa Catalina Mountains near Tucson, Arizona hold a delightful surprise. It is here that we will visit the Eagle Mountain Garden Railroad, a 20 plus year project of Peggy and Gary Martin. In G Gage, I started about 24 years ago, my wife wanted a train around a Christmas tree, so I went down and bought a Lionel G-Gage and put it around the tree, and then every year after that, it got started going more and more track around the house, and eventually we said we need to take this out of the house, and then I put my first 30 feet in out around one of the trees on the side of the yard. With the leap to outdoors, the railroad started to expand. I added the White Mountains, and then from the White Mountains, I decided I'd go into the desert part of this, so I put the desert theme up there, trying to put in different mountains and configurations from different places in Arizona. Then I looked, started looking at the mining area, and I put in the pit mine, which as far as I know is the only G-gauge pit mine in the country. Uh, from there on, I went on down and, and put in the final section, which was really put in a raised section so that people could come drive their trucks in and unload their trains. Plantings reflect the area. I used a lot of cacti and a lot of the natural plants that, uh, that come with this area around here. Uh, desert broom is one. We don't like desert broom, but we use it because it grows naturally here and it's easy to maintain. One area that Gary loves is the Copper Queen Mine. The Copper Queen Mine really is a mine in uh, southern Arizona. Now the difference is most mines, people know, do not have trains running to the bottom of them. However, I decided after going to the Copper Queen Mine and looking at the pit mine that the nice, the, the real way to do it would be to show a train going into the bottom of it. So uh, I went ahead and built it that way. Just like a real railroad, the Eagle Mountain has to deal with environmental issues. The main problem in, in southern Arizona, I'd say not only in Tucson, but all southern Arizona, is the heat. Your track, if it's a five-foot section, expands at about quarter inch per every 90 degrees. 
So you're, if you don't tie the track down well, it will expand, it will break out ballast. I learned a long time ago that the best way to do this was put a lot of expansion joints in and concrete my ties, not my track, into place. The other, uh, the other item that is uh, pretty prevalent here as far as having uh, major problems with, again, on the heat is just the buildings, the structures, keeping, keeping them together. If you do leave them out, uh, they will deteriorate very quickly. Visitors have to look closely, but in doing so, we'll find all sorts of special scenes and hear special sounds. Some of the buildings here that you'll see, for instance, uh, would be the uh, sawmill. It totally operates. If Once it's turned on, uh, the uh, log car moves back and forth. All of the uh, uh, saws turn. All the loading operation turns. I have uh, also many small vignettes around with sound systems in it. There's a mine blast. Uh, there's a mariachi music, there's uh, hoedown music. So all around the railroad, there's little vignettes where the children can push the button and, and hear what's going on. Mountain construction on this railroad required the development of special techniques. The technique I used for the mountains varied all the way from rebar and styrofoam all the way down to a chicken wire base. Over the top of that is a big hole burlap uh, that can really be purchased about any Lowe's or Home Depot. They're then cut into strips and they're dipped into wet stucco and then draped over the, the base just like you would do in an HO layout where you're using uh, other types of materials. Other ways were tried. That's the only one I could find that worked well outdoors. Gary's wife Peggy has some special thoughts about the railroad. Gary was an art major in college, and I really feel this is an extension of art. Um, when he thinks about it and does it, it's, it's an extension of his art. We try to incorporate the, uh, things that, we, that are important and that we care about. And to the, over here, I, we have four, five houses that are dedicated to our granddaughters. So that is probably one of my favorite parts. Garden railroads are never completed, and the Eagle Mountain is no exception. The future really is automation. Uh, I'm starting to do a lot more of that just to make the, the train a little bit more interesting. I've got several ide other items around there, stamping mill, that type of things, that'll give a little more action to the railroad. It's plain that Gary and Peggy have crafted a perfect example of an Arizona Garden Railroad. Hi, I'm Dave Ball. Our final classic tracks story of this season takes me back to my home state, Iowa. Now, narrow gauge railroads weren't just found in the mountains in the western U.S. There was a little known line that struggled in the heart of the Midwest, Iowa's slim princess, the Chicago, Bellevue, Cascade, and Western Railroad. It was an exciting time in 1879, Cascade, Iowa. The railroad was coming. With two mills on the Makokota River, Cascade was booming and the town was looking for a gateway to the outside world. A spider web of steel started to make its way across the United States. Each and every town was convinced that their survival depended on the railroad connection. And this little eastern Iowa town was no exception. It really brought them up to the forefront in, in this part of the country, remembering that uh, Galena, Illinois, 18 miles east of, uh, of Dubuque, one time was larger than Chicago. And, uh, and then the, the flow of traffic coming out to that area then crossed into Dubuque. Well, everybody wanted a little piece of the action, so they would start their towns, and it was a lot of granaries, it was a lot of different things that they manufactured. The problem was getting that product out of their towns into the mainstream. So the Chicago, Bellevue, Cascade, and Western Railroad was formed to connect the towns of Cascade on the west and Bellevue on the east, where the 36-mile line would connect with the great Milwaukee Road. The philosophy of many small railroads of the time was that construction of a narrow-gauge operation was the best way to start. You could build a uh, narrow-gauge railroad for about maybe a third, a fourth or a third, of what it would take to build the same thing in standard-gauge. 
Now the reels were 36 inches apart. As a result, you didn't need as much banking and grading because the locomotives weren't as heavy. The cars and equipment were a lot lighter and cheaper, lower cost, if you will. The builders of these smaller railroads held the firm belief that once completed, they would be swallowed up by the larger standard gauge railroads, who would then upgrade the line to standard gauge. In 1880, the plan seemed to be working for the little CBC and Western. Right on schedule, the Milwaukee Road bought the line. The citizens of the area were overjoyed. The future was bright indeed. But the Milwaukee Road engineers determined that the terrain was too hilly and that an existing 2.8% grade would present expensive problems for converting the little line. So expensive that the line would never be profitable. As a result, the railroad remained narrow gauge, much to the frustration of the local patrons. The railroad had only one major accident in its history. Well, 1907, uh, Mary Rowan was riding in the combine, half passenger, half baggage, and she was talking to another lady. She said how happy she was to get home to her children. She'd been away for a few days. And they came into the Washington Mill uh, bridge, and the last car, which was the combine, jumped the tracks. And that the car went over and fell on the, to the blow about 30, 40 feet, closed like a book. She died, the uh, conductor ultimately died, and there were a few other injuries, but not that severe. By the early 20th century, trouble was brewing. The growth of Dubuque to the north and Davenport to the south overshadowed Little Bellevue. Shippers could get their goods to the banks of the Mississippi, but items still had to be transferred to the standard gauge cars for the final run to the larger markets. By 1932, with the Depression in full force, the Milwaukee Road was ready to abandon the little line. But before the line could be torn up, a savior appeared in the form of Minnesota businessman Earl Bradley. Bradley purchased the line in 1933, and once the ink on the contract was dry, revealed his plans. Bradley was eager to test a new concept in railroading, rubber-tired wheels riding on steel rails. The rubber-tired vehicles had already been pioneered in France and were in use by the Texas and Pacific and Reading Railroads. But instead of resembling the sleek chrome cars of the larger railroads, Bradley's first vehicle, painted a bright yellow and dubbed the Canary, looked like a milk truck. Not only did it look clumsy, it was underpowered to the point where it could only move one or two freight cars at a time. Bradley was confronted with incredibly bad luck. The canary was irreparably damaged by a cracked block in the winter of 1935, when an employee failed to drain the engine. Record snowfalls hobbled the line in the mid-1930s as well. By 1936, Bradley had had enough. A government loan designed to bail out the little line was denied, and Bradley contracted with short line experts William Bell and William Schoenthal. They were to make the line profitable or scrap it. After heavy snowfalls in 1936, and with the snowplow broken beyond repair, the experts opted to scrap the line. And by 1937, with the rails torn up, the engines and equipment sold or abandoned, the little line became only a memory. Little remains today of the Chicago, Bellevue, Cascade, and Western. There are a few repurposed buildings and some railway embankments. The original depot at Lamont houses a museum dedicated to the line. Well, the depot is the original depot in the original location and we restored that about four, 14 years ago and uh, the box car we just picked up the box car about uh, two years ago and we plan on restoring all that. The uh, caboose was built around 1880 by the Ohio Falls Car Company. It was uh, built for the uh, Bellevue and Cascade and was the only operating caboose on that line until 1936 when the line shut down. The caboose was then purchased by one of the engineers that used to run on the Bellevue and Cascade and was used as a storage shed on their farm until um, Jim Schrader bought it of Bellevue, Iowa. When Jim purchased the caboose, it was in very bad disrepair and uh, started meticulous restoration of uh, restoring it from the ground up. We uh, finished the restoration on the car to make it roadworthy to pull behind the trains here and have been using it here on the grounds ever since and we're happy to have it. Presently, Cascade, Bernard, and Zwingle are becoming a part of the urban spread of Dubuque. 
of the little line, which held on for better than half a century, the only notable statement is that the railroad was 36 by 36 by 36. It was 36 miles long, it was 36 inches wide, and sometimes it took 36 hours to get there. Preserving rail stories and history is close to all rail fans. Restored pieces of the Iowa Slim Princess are still on display, while artifacts of the original line can still be seen at the Lamont Museum. Well, that's all for this episode. Please join us next time for more Tracks Ahead.